I'm Lynn Morris. I'm, the Unis I'm a Unison Regional Manager in the Northwest. I'm also a uh, Unison Northwest Political Officer and Chair of Northwest Chulo. So it's a great pleasure to be here tonight. And um, what I, looks like a lot of friends, a lot of old friends, well, I was going to say old friends then, probably most of you are younger than I am. So I'm just going to say friends. Um, we've brought together a range of speakers for tonight's rally, including politicians and Unison activists. Uh, we'll have time for some questions at the end on topics of interest that are to, uh, of interest to Unison uh, members in Lancashire. Just to let you know, we are recording tonight's uh, rally. It will be made available uh, to Unison members uh, on the YouTube channel, and it will be promoted to our membership in Lancashire. That's after requests of people saying they couldn't make the rally, so we are trying to include as many people as possible. As public service workers, Unison members have helped people to get through the pandemic and are central to the delivery of the vaccine. As we move forward, it's vital that we learn the lessons uh, and reflect our uh, compassion and, and commitment in the corridors of power. And this election allows us to do that. We can never again let public services be underfunded for a decade like they have been. We should never again be so ill prepared for a crisis like we have been for this one. We can have no return to, the, to normal that sees key workers ignored and undervalued. They have to be at the centre of the decisions that we're going to make going forward. We need people representing us who really understand how public services work, who understand how hard it is for our families and who are committed to decent jobs and services. These elections are our first opportunity to really put this right. Uh, Unison advocates, uh, advocates for policies that are good for public services, good for workers, um, that are good for the Lancashire, for Lancashire County, like support, supporting our Stand Up for Campaigners campaign, support for good employment standards for all, and, for, uh, and oppose the public sector pay freeze bring public services back in house and, reserve, and reverse the practice of selling off public assets for private profit. When the post pandemic recovery comes, we need to shape that recovery that favors workers, favors good well-paid jobs and favors put good public services. We are encouraging all Unison members in Lancashire to make their voices heard in defense of our public services vote for candidates who listen to Unison and act to protect the public services we, our members deliver. So without further ado, you've heard enough from me. I'm going to call our first speaker tonight. And Elaine really is an old friend, although much younger than me, I have to say. Uh, a long serving branch secretary of Lancashire County branch and, one, and Unison's Northwest president. So thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you to those who've joined the event tonight. My name is Linus and is Elaine Cottle, and I'm the Northwest Regional President and Branch Secretary of Lancashire Unison Branch. I represent workers in Lancashire County Council, schools, colleges, social care, and many other private community and voluntary organisations that deliver public services across our county. Over the last four years, my branch has seen what it means to have a Conservative administration run the County Council. Within the first few weeks of taking control of the County Council, the Tory administration decided to attack the trade unions by ceasing all trade union facility time. It was the same old Tories and things didn't get any better from then on. There have been cuts to critical services across Lancashire and services that many of the most vulnerable in Lancashire relied upon. We saw the absolutely disgraceful proposal to cut the foundation living wage the thousands of low paid county council staff. Were it not for Unison campaigning with Labour and others to highlight the scandal, then the Conservatives would have got away with it. County council staff were also faced with £5 million worth of cuts to terms and conditions of employment. Again, Unison managed to successfully argue against these proposals to stop staff pay cuts. We managed to stop it, but it shows, in my view, that key workers can't trust the Tories. Many of our members work in social care, have seen, their, have seen cuts to their pay as a result of the Tory administration's decision to cut millions of pounds from their sleeping rates. Yes, we all know the laws changed around sleepings, 
but Labour councils across the North West maintain the higher payments to social care staff. Not the Tories in County Hall, though. They refused to even meet with concerned care workers, stating that there was no point in meeting them because they were not going to change their position. Our care workers deserve better than this. And it is our care workers, alongside many other key worker units and members, that have kept the country going during the pandemic. Schools, for example, have remained open throughout the pandemic, sometimes with reduced pupil numbers, but they have remained open and school support staff have worked throughout. Over the last few years, schools have faced unprecedented cuts to staff and the remaining staff have been downgraded and had their hours cut. One sector hit particularly hard are our maintained nurseries. The cuts the nurseries have suffered are horrendous, and that is down to a failure by the Tory government to fund them properly, which is pushing them towards the brink. And what was the County Council Tory administration's response? To vote against Labour proposals to establish an emergency fund to support our nurseries, and instead order a review of their financial viability. In other words, just manage their decline and close them. This shows how clueless they are to the needs of Lancashire's communities. And all we've heard for the last four years is Tory councillors blaming Labour for county council cuts, when the blame for the council's lack of resources and local government finances in general lies solely with the Conservative Party who've been in government since 2010. They've ripped money out of Lancashire year after year. And I'm sickened by the sight of Tory politicians praising our key workers for their work in the pandemic, whilst at the same time imposing a pay freeze on the very same workers they have just been clapping on the doorsteps. And millions have been spent on dodgy government contracts, and yet the Conservatives say there is no money for Lancashire's public services and no money for Lancashire's key workers. The Conservatives have failed Lancashire and we're being left behind. And I don't know of many people who can honestly say that their lives have become better in the last few years and that they feel better off, that they feel healthier and that things in their area are improving. It's generally the opposite of that. Things are getting worse. So the 6th of May is our opportunity to make our voices heard. We need politicians that will speak up for Lancashire and politicians that will speak up for unison and members and key workers. Lancashire Labour are the only ones that have a credible plan to speak up for Lancashire and support public services and key workers. Whether it is Clive Grunshaw as Police and Crime Commissioner or as our ally at the County Council, Unison knows who is on the side of our members. These elections matter and it is our chance to have our say and elect people that speak up for us and improve things for Unison members. So speak to your friends, family and colleagues let them know these elections are happening. Let them know why it matters. Let us get the Labour team elected on the 6th of May. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. OK, my ne the next guest. I'd like to welcome our special guest. It's Kat Smith, MP for Lancaster and Fleetwood. Uh, Kat successfully wrestled um, that seat from the, uh, the Tories in 2017 election. Uh, sorry, 2015 election, yes, and then rewon it in 2017 and 2019, and is now one of only four parliamentary uh, parliamentarians left in Lancashire, 16 seats. Uh, in addition, there is uh, Sir Lindsay Hoyle uh, of Chorley. But on it, but Kat, you've been a great friend to us, and you've always been a, a strong campaigner. Before uh, you were elected, I know you worked for a national social work organisation and was a trustee of local charities uh, supporting victims of domestic violence. You've campaigned against austerity measures you, imposed by the uh, Conservative government, measures that have seen rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. As an MP, you've regularly spoke on climate change. You fought against the fracking at Preston New Road and the development of the huge grass storage facility at Presall. You're a member of Labour's shadow cabinet and as a shadow minister uh, for voter engagement and young people. Kat, you're a real solid friend for Unison in, in the Northwest and I thank you. It's our great pleasure to have you here tonight. So I'll hand over to you. Gosh, thank you, Lynn. That's such a 
a lovely introduction and I feel quite um, surprised by quite how much I've been getting up to in recent years. Sometimes you don't really stop and think and you just kind of plow on and carry on. Um, but I just want to say thank you in return to Unison, uh, but particularly your members in Unison who are those key workers who, if we've learned anything, frankly, in the last 12 months of the pandemic, it is who are the real true key workers. Who is it that has kept our schools open? Who is it that has been working on the front line in our NHS? Who is it that has been delivering council services? Um, and so often then it is your members, it is Unison members, not just across Lancashire, but across the whole country, who have been those key workers who have kept things going, who have kept um, kids, if key workers in schools educated so that their parents can work. It has been your members, frankly, who have kept things going and it is your members um, who we stood on doorsteps and we clapped for. And actually Tory ministers stood on doorsteps and clapped for too, if you remember, uh, but they seem to have forgotten now because they seem to be uh, talking about offering many of your workers a measly 1% pay rise, but more on that later. Um, you've asked me uh, to address the rally tonight about the elections, the May the 6th elections. Now, it's not very long to go now. It's 16 days to go. And a bit like buses, uh, you wait ages and then two come along at once because, of course, there was a set of elections last year that got cancelled because of we're at the beginning of the COVID pandemic and we didn't quite know what the lay of the land was going to look like. And um, so it's a bumper set of elections with electors getting ballot papers right across uh, the country and Lancashire being absolutely no exception to that. Um, I just want to plug, you have until midnight tonight uh, to register to vote. So um, if you do one thing immediately after this rally, it is to get on your social media channels. And particularly if you know uh, young colleagues or if you've got younger family members, young people are far less likely to be registered to vote. Uh, make sure that you explain how quick and easy it is to go to gov.uk forward slash register hyphen to hyphen vote. Yeah, they made it catchy, didn't they? Um, and take five minutes to encourage any young family members or colleagues to actually register to vote tonight because Frankly, uh, if you don't do politics, politics will do you. And we've seen that is so true, particularly for uh, our younger colleagues uh, and young people generally. Um, but yeah, so register to vote. Uh, and here in Lancashire, uh, you'll get the chance to vote for Clive Brunshaw, re-electing him as our Police and Crime Commissioner. Uh, you may also get the chance to vote for your Lancashire County Councillor, uh, but you may also uh, get the chance to vote for your Blackpool or Blackburn Councillors, depending on which bit of the county uh, that you're living in. In fact, if you're really lucky, you might even have a by-election to your borough city parish council as well. So it might be that you're getting three uh, ballot papers on May the 6th. So it's absolutely worth uh, registering to vote and having your say um, and to use your vote for Labour. Because when we vote Labour, it is a vote that is about standing up for working people and communities, you know, right across Lancashire and up and down the country. And we know that our priorities as Labour people are the priorities of the people of Lancashire. You know, what we're talking about is about securing the economy. You know, Labour is backing business and jobs because we know how important uh, they are for all of us. You know, we'll support and invest in businesses to rebuild our communities. Uh, we've been out today talking about how we're going to protect the high street and create jobs for the future. But we're also the party, of course, of the NHS. And I vote in Labour, it is a vote for quitting waiting lists, improving cancer care and rewarding our NHS workers. And it is a vote for rebuilding the country uh, by making our neighbourhoods safe. And I'm sure Clive will, will say more about this, but you know, the vote for Labour is about getting police out from behind those desks, getting bobbies back on the beat, uh, which is something I've heard Clive say so many times. And it's about tackling antisocial behaviour and introducing to the sentences for violent offenders. Labour is very much on the side of working people. Labour is very much on the side of Unison members. And we want to be sure that the UK is a great place to grow up, grow old and, and, um, and to live in, frankly. You know, up and down the country, um, myself and Shadow Cabinet colleagues were campaigning and spreading that message that a vote for Labour is about building stronger, more secure communities. Uh, because if we, we've learned during the pandemic that it was actually Labour councils and Labour councillors who went above and beyond in helping our communities because we're part of our communities. And that's been alongside the heroic efforts of NHS frontline workers, 
Um, and it's them that have pioneered that contact tracing. It wasn't these private companies that Tory government brought in to, you know, take lots of money and not really deliver anything, which we've seen time and time again. And we've come out of this pandemic and it's those labour values that uh, matter most to us and our communities that we want to see um, elected into county hall. We want to see labour uh, protecting those public services and investing in businesses and towns and high streets right across the county. Um, a Labour County Council will work to protect our incomes, our family incomes, and you know it will be Labour councils working with Labour MPs and Labour Police and Crime Commissioners to oppose those Tory tax rises uh, that you know are completely counterproductive because they slow the recovery and put jobs at risk. And we'll work with local people to provide the homes that our communities want. And we'll never hesitate to stand up to the developers who don't have residents' interests at heart. Um, because if you follow the money, you can see why some parties don't necessarily want to stand up to, to those um, developers. Um, I do want to say a few words, Lynn, um, about um, police, uh, policing and crime. Um, I've known Clive. Um, quite a long time. I, I actually haven't calculated how long it is, Clive. Um, but I've known Clive since very shortly after I joined the Labour Party, and I've seen his uh, tenacious campaigning, uh, not just on police and crime issues, but on so many other issues that matter to me. In fact, one of the issues that, that Clive uh, really champions that's close to my heart, Lynn referred to at the beginning that I was a trustee of some charities before I was elected to Parliament, and one very close to my heart was uh, Lancaster and District Women's Aid, uh, latterly uh, empowerment um, on the Fowl Coast and Clive gets it. Clive understands how important it is to support, support victims of domestic violence and to um, tackle the root causes and I have every faith that um, as our police and crime commissioner uh, that is something that is incredibly high up Clive's agenda and something which affects families from all different backgrounds in all corners of our county. And I say thanks on the public record now, Clive, for the commitment that you put into that cause because it really does matter and make a difference to huge numbers of lives. And you'll probably never know how many lives you've changed through the policies that you've uh, pursued as our police and crime commissioner. Um, but perhaps, you know, the more sort of general issues um, is the fact that, you know, we've, we've tried to manage 10 years now with continued cuts. Uh, you know, Lancashire Constabulary has lost 650 police officers and has had to make savings of £86 million. Pounds. And, you know, Clive's got to find a further £20 million by 2025. That's, I mean, it's just colossal. And it represents one of the biggest losses um, in the country in terms of police numbers. If you want a comparison, Surrey, leafy Surrey, down in the south of England, they gained 38 officers in the same time period that we've lost 650 here in Lancashire. And um, so I'd say that's absolutely clear messaging that there is definitely a north south divide and we're on the losing side of that right now. Um, but by re-electing Clive, we're sending a really clear message. We want our bobbies back and we're not gonna put up with this. The next Labour government will have to repair uh, all the damage that's been done to policing and the criminal justice system more widely um, after the last 10 years of Tory incompetence and cruelty. Um, they're continuing to choose to slash funding. It erodes that neighbourhood policing and even at a time when crime is rising nationally and more and more criminals are going unpunished. We're seeing huge delays in the court system. Victims have been left in limbo for years. And the justice system is grinding to a halt. And there is that saying that, you know, justice delayed is justice denied. It is so true. And one of the most difficult conversations that I have as a, as a local MP is, is meeting with victims of crime who are waiting for that justice and uh, feeling incredibly let down. And I know that Clive will speak for them. Clive speaks with victims. Um, so let's go and re-elect Labour's Clive Brunshaw as our police and crime commissioner on the 6th of May to make sure that we send that really clear message uh, that we want our bobbies back. These are the values that matter to us, community policing and um, tackling domestic violence across the county. And let's make sure we get that neighbourhood administration in County Hall as well. Because I know that as and his team's priorities are the priorities of the people of Lancashire. If you had to have a look uh, at the manifesto, and I won't steal uh, Abba's funders, I suspect he'll probably talk to it, um, that manifesto contains so many commitments to every corner of Lancashire, and certainly in my corner of Lancashire, 
Um, one of the things that we're really excited to see is that commitment to uh, bring the railway back into Fleetwood. That's something that is about connecting communities, it's about making sure that that connection brings jobs and prosperity, good jobs, well-paid jobs, and dare I say it, unionised jobs. Um, because we know that the Labour Party, working with our trade unions, um, can actually offer us such a better future for the working people of Lancashire and frankly across the country. Uh, so I'm really enjoying going out campaigning for candidates across Lancashire and across the country. And I know that on May the 6th, um, we can really make, send a strong message to government that we ain't going to put up with this. But if you want to send that message, you've got to register to vote. You've got till midnight tonight. It takes five minutes. And if you're not registered, you can't vote. And if you can't vote, well, politics is going to do you. Thanks. Thanks, Kat. Um, right, our next speaker is Clive Grunshaw, and I feel like I don't need to introduce him now. He's Everybody's uh, said such wonderful things about him, but yeah, Clive has been a solid supporter uh, of Unison. He previously served on Lancashire County Council. Um, he was uh, a ward councillor on Wire Council. And at the moment, you lead uh, uh, the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners, I understand, for the Portfolio Group on Fraud and Cybercrime. I mean, you know, you do make sure that uh, people in Lancashire have a voice uh, in policing, which is what you set out to do. You always wanted to make sure it was accessible and transparent. And I think you've achieved that in your first term and you're going to go on and achieve even greater things. But how you've done it under the financial pressures you've been under, Clive, I really don't know. So uh, I'm going to say before I say anything else, just hand over to you and let you tell us. Thanks very much, Clive. OK, thanks. Lynn. Well, what a build up. Thank you. Um, listen, thanks for the invitation to speak. I just want to, as um, as Kat said, really, pay tribute to the, the public sector workers, the key workers, and of course, UNICEF members who have stepped up and kept us and our families and children safe over the, the past 12 months of the pandemic. You know, it is about working people pulling together and protecting working people. So it's really to begin with by thanking you for everything that you do and everything that you have done uh, for us. You know, thankfully, there is now light at the end of the tunnel. Well, we hope, don't we? Uh, we hope that the worst is over and the, the rebuilding is about to begin. Um, I think over the past 12 months, it's been a difficult time for, for many people with the, the lockdowns, the isolation, the mental health, the real struggles um, within society, the financial pressures, you know, Kat has mentioned about domestic abuse and that's been one of the biggest uh, concerns that we have and making sure that the services are still there and we campaign to make sure that people know where they can go for advice and support for that. You know, but there are always winners and losers, aren't there? You know, what, whatever the circumstances, there are people uh, they're the ones that suffer the most and they're the people that seem to come out of it better than, than anyone else. Uh, let's have a look at the, the winners. Well, what about Matt, Hanc Matt Hancock's neighbour uh, or the bloke he met down the pub that had a whole lot of dodgy PPE to knock out on the sly? You know, the, the way this government works is unreal. Um, bumbling Boris himself, a man with no shame no principles but for some bizarre reason he's getting all of the credit for the work that has been done by the nhs and none of the blame for his government's complete incompetence to prepare for the pandemic and let's be clear you know the pandemic was predicted you know a few years before everything was in place to resolve this and through the cuts by this government it was stripped away this is the most incompetent government ever, and it has cost people's lives. And of course, the losers. Well, who's going to pay Rishi's bill at the end of this? You know, who's going to pay Matt Hancock's mates uh, for all the PPE? Um, I mean, I could say everyone, and that would be partly true. But then I think back to the, the banking crisis in 2010 when this government first came in and it wasn't everyone then it was the public sector it was public services that paid the bill then have been paying ever since you know as Lynn mentioned and and 
of course, count myself in terms of the, the cuts we've had to endure with policing, £86 million, over 25% of our budget that's been taken away. When I came in, consulted with the public for what they wanted, they want more bodies on the day, more, more police officer numbers, more visibility. And you've had over 25% of the workforce stripped away. You know, it's the public sector that's been paying the bill. And it's the public sector that had been devastated by 10 years of cuts from this government. The public sector cannot survive more Tory cuts. They can't be the ones to pay the bill now for the pandemic when they're still suffering the cuts for the misguided economic decisions of this government over the past 10 years. You know, for anyone who values public services, Roads, youth services, libraries, parks, leisure centres, education, health, fire, police, and much, much more for what is provided for the, the public. We have got to send a message to this government. We've got to send a message that enough is enough. The public services have been cut to the bones, and actually, public services are valued. By the public sometimes the public don't really understand just how much they need public services and that is part of our challenge to make sure people understand what is being delivered on their behalf we've got to say to this government not this time boris this election needs to be a referendum on saving our public services which are there to support the public and communities. They're to support the most in need in society. They are not there just to be privatised and exploited, which is the way this government views the public sector. Not for what they deliver, but for what they can take out of it, how much money they can make from it. That is how they view the public sector, because, of course, if you're a Tory that's been to Eton or wherever most of them tend to, to go to, they don't need the public sector in the way that we do. They're not working people like we are. They don't see the people that are in dire need of the services that we provide. You know, Kat mentioned about uh, women's aid, and I've, there's some horrendous stories that, that I see of people that have been abused for many years before we can get them out of those circumstances. We can't afford to lose more services and leave people in those circumstances. You know, we need more investment to help people. And this is a fight, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to get that message out to the public for the services that we're providing, that we're providing and the support that we're giving. Now, everyone, should get out and vote on the 6th of May. Not everyone will, but they should do. Uh, and again, that's part of our challenge to get the message out to the public. You know, there's this mythical kind of red wall and people uh, that have turned away from Labour. Now, I've got to tell you, I'm not seeing that. People are concerned about services and people do identify with Labour. You know, we are getting a good response on the doorstep, but we need to convert that goodwill and that understanding into actual votes, into people going to a polling station, getting a postal vote. We need to convert that, that concern over the, the cuts. The way that Lancashire and the North has been treated by this government, disproportionately in terms of the, the extent of the cuts compared with people in the South of England. You know, it's not only the cuts, it's the unfairness. And there's reasons for that. And that the reason is that they've, allowed, they've shifted the burden of paying for the incre increase in police officers onto the council tax. And we know that in Lancashire, you can't, you know, 2% in, Lan in Lancashire raises half the amount for policing that 2% in Surrey raises. That's the reason. But they are bigger houses, they can raise far more in the council tax. When we've been cut, it's been on a bigger portion of our budget than theirs. And when the burden for paying for the uplift 
is shifted more onto the council tax, we can raise far less. It's an unfair system that we are being victimized by. We need to challenge that. <clears throat> so these elections are really, really important. And I would know that I'm preaching to the choir is, if you wasn't supporting us, you probably wouldn't be uh, watching this now. But we've got two weeks now to get out there, to, to speak to our families, our friends, our communities, and make our voices heard. People have got to listen to us. These elections are the stepping stones towards a Labour victory that is desperately needed in 2024. <clears throat> it won't happen overnight, but unless we start now, we will never get there. So, <clears throat> colleagues, comrades, friends, union members, let's march forward together. Vote Labour on the 6th of May and make sure everyone you know votes Labour as well. This is so, so important that we start the fight back and there's no better time than now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Clive. Okay, we'll move on because we're a little bit behind. I want to get as many questions as I can um, in. So I'm going to call the next speaker, uh, Azar Ali. I got to know Azar really well in the 2019 elections. And I'm, I know from experience his campaign will be um, hectic, if nothing else. Well, but, so it's good to have you on board again, Azar. Azar is the leader of Lancashire County Labour Group. Um, he was elected to the County Council in 2013 having previously served on Pendle Council and five years as a government advisor serving under Prime Ministers Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. He became the leader of Lancashire County Council uh, Labour team in 2017 and he was recognised for his services um, for the community uh, by being awarded at the OBE in the Queen's uh, 2020 Honours List. So Azar, it's great as always to see you again and great to have you back on the campaign trail. Thank you very much, Lynn, and, and thank everyone for listening to this uh, rally this evening. Um, I just, Elaine and uh, Kat and Clive have said a lot of things which uh, I don't want to repeat necessarily, but I want to start by thanking the Unison team at Lancashire, uh, Elaine, Jason uh, uh, and James, because they've been our rock, really. Uh, they've been our rock uh, in the uh, county labour group. We've had regular meetings and we've stood side by side to fight the Tory cuts. Uh, my group four years ago, which I inherited, 50% of the group were women, but previously there was about 80% of the cabinet had been men. So one of the first things I pledged to the group was that I would make sure that uh, we had more women in the shadow cabinet. And I think the last count, there were about 80% of the shadow cabinet were women, but we've not only just, it's been tokenism, but it's actually been an opportunity for a lot of the members of the group to go out and get onto leadership programmes uh, and to come back and share their expertise and uh, knowledge with the rest of us. I think, fingers crossed, on May the 7th, uh, there's a Labour-controlled county council. And as Clive said, you know, on the doorstep, we don't hear the B word anymore. Brexit hasn't been mentioned once to me, which uh, is a relief. Um, but people are more positive about what's happening. But they can also see the damage the Tories have caused over the last four years. They can see the damage to our roads, to our infrastructure, to social services and to education. But one of the first things that... Uh, under a Labour-controlled uh, county council with John and I at the helm will be that we'll reinstate facilities time, we'll review sleeping rates, and we'll sit down from day one or week one uh, with the Unison team and the unions and work with them to make sure that we have a balanced budget and that we invest in our services. And one of the other things that we're going to do, working very closely with Clive, is to introduce average speed cameras you know, uh, even earlier on today, before I got in my car to take this, um, join this call, uh, people are talking about speeding and they don't want uh, speed ramps. They want something that's going to work and that's something that can pay for itself. And average speed cameras work in other parts of the country, particularly in Yorkshire. We, you see them regularly uh, and we want to introduce them in, in Lancashire as well, where we have the hotspots. Our manifesto, Lynn, is not a manifesto that's been created by a few of us sat in a, in a little room. It's something that's been created by harnessing the resources and the knowledge and the expertise of thousands of Labour Party members up and down the county 
our union uh, stakeholders uh, and others in the community. Uh, and our manifesto has a host of things that we want to try and do over four years of a Labour Control County Council. And one of the things we want to do is invest in our maintained nurseries. Maintained nurseries have been left behind by the Tory government. And as Elaine said earlier, you know, we moved year after year, million pound extra for our maintained nurseries so they don't have to shut or they don't have to scrimp and save. But the Tories voted against it. And that's one of the first things we're going to do is invest in our nurseries until the government comes up with a proper solution to where we go with it. Uh, there's many schools up and down the county which are bursting at the seams and the Lancashire County Council hasn't expanded them. Uh, and I know that if we have enablers to open new schools, they have to be academies or free schools. We're not going to go down that route, but what we have placed is to work with those schools where there is existing space to expand them so local children don't have to travel a couple of miles down the road uh, from their neighbourhood to go to a primary school. Uh, Kat talked about infrastructure. Uh, that is a massive priority for us. We realise that if we're going to uh, ex uh, excel in terms of jobs and training and keep our best and the brightest in Lancashire, we need to Im improve in our infrastructure. The Poulton Fleetwood link and the barrage at Fleetwood, which uh, we've dubbed the Beavers Barrage, uh, because the amount of campaigning that Lorraine Beavers and one of our colleagues has done on this. The Corn to Skipton railway line, it was in the Labour uh, manifesto at the last general election to electrify that. Uh, regulation of buses, 20 million extra for roads and millions more for flood defences. And because what we want to do is build Lancashire into a powerhouse, the Lancashire powerhouse. And we've seen how well Andy Burnham and Steve Rotherham have done in Greater Manchester and in, in, in Merseyside. And we've now got West Yorkshire as well with um, elected mayor. What we want to do is work with our colleagues across the north of England to turn Lancashire into the powerhouse that, and, and the powerhouse and create the jobs uh, and uh, really make sure that our potential is maximised. And these are some of the things that we want to do, but we can't do it without our members, without our councillors. And on May the 6th, we've uh, got a real opportunity uh, to turn Lancashire red. And there's a number of districts which, like Chorley and Pendle, which have got out all our elections, uh, and other district councillors as well. And we've got to make sure that people use all their votes for Labour uh, to make sure not only counties turn red, but our districts, we increase our seats and we make sure that those districts remain Labour. And working together with our MPs, our Labour MPs, I'm sure that we can make a massive difference in Lancashire and win back uh, the country in 2024. Thank you very much, Lynn. Thanks, Azar. OK, our final speaker tonight um, is another friend of ours, very much so, um, Fiona Wilde, who is the chair of Unison East Lancashire Health Branch. Uh, I've known Fiona for a number of years now, but uh, more recently, um, we nearly got on a picket line together, but they managed to get a very good settlement uh, in the hospital. So well done to Fiona and her team up there. Um, Fiona has, works in the NHS and she's on the front line and she's seen the difficulties all the way through this pandemic and has, has witnessed the impact it's had on their members and how the, the Tories uh, running down the NHS has had an impact but she's not sat back she's got up and she's now taken the the call and she's standing to fight back not only in unison but also as uh, she's been selected as the Labour candidate in Burnley Gann Award so Fiona over to you you're on mute Fiona Typical. I said that, didn't I? Um, so thank you, Lynn. Um, yeah, as, as Lynn says, I'm Fiona Wilde and I speak as branch chair of East Lancashire Health Branch. And I, along with a very strong uh, team of branch officers, have been involved throughout the pandemic in taking daily concerns of our health staff members to both our management at ELHT and in the private healthcare sector. I don't often quote Churchill, uh, but he once said, never was so much awed by so many to so few. And whilst this was about the fighter pilots in World War II, it feels very much appropriate to that which we in the NHS have gone through in the last 12 months. Our NHS is a great institution, Britain at its best, founded, well-funded and defended by Labour. The NHS, along with social care and other key workers, 
have got us through this pandemic, but we were ill prepared for this crisis after 10 years of Tory austerity. We really didn't know what had hit us at the beginning of 2020. Our hospitals felt like a war zone. We were being given guidance that had filtered down from the government to NHS England, to NHS trusts, and then on to staff, which would change on a daily, if not sometimes an hour by hour basis. And on top of that, there was conflicting information and concerns over the provision of PPE. We were all bewildered, but adrenaline kicked in. Every single one of our organisation, regardless of job title or banding, pulled together. When one of us struggled, the others would support. We just had to stick together and get through it, because in my opinion, the government just didn't know what they were doing from one minute to the next. They were as much use as a chocolate fire guard. It was left to the front line to decide what needed to be done, and they got on with it. Even though they were scared, tired and bemused, when others were at home safely locked down, our staff still had to come into work every day and care for people who were themselves scared, tired and bemused. But they had to try and keep the patient's spirits up. They dealt with the loss of life at a rate never before heard of in our lifetime and saw things they would never wish on anyone. Those images will never go away. The Tories who buried a war game scenario report in 2016 on how to handle a future pandemic because they refused to fund what was needed. The Tories who locked down late, reopened too early and brought the appalling second wave down upon us last summer. The Tories who spent 37 billion pounds on contracts for their cronies in the failed test and trace system. All of this has seen Britain with one of the highest death rates in the world. And you know what, how sad is that? At the heart of the pandemic, we had 343 COVID patients in our hospitals. We now have 11. And that is down to the dedication, care and hard work of all our staff. We've lost colleagues along the way. We've had to grieve for them whilst co continuing to battle against COVID-19. And sadly, we have had to battle for workers' rights to be protected in the workplace at a time when the NHS was needed more than it ever has been before. The COVID-19 vaccination has been developed and delivered because it has been a partnership between the NHS, our universities and our scientists, scientists with much needed publicly funded research and our high level pharmaceutical industry. And as we see ourselves coming to the light at the very long, uh, coming to the end of a very dark tunnel, we find ourselves insult insulted by the offer of a measly 1% pay increase from the government, who expect us to be grateful that we have been offered anything at all. Key workers have delivered for Britain. We have earned a decent pay rise. All workers should get it, and it will help the economy recover as workers spend. The Prime Minister claimed to Tory MPs that it was greed that delivered the vaccine, which he then tried to pass off as a joke. This just shows the contempt they have for public services. The Prime Minister would also have us believe that he has led a united country, as we are all in the same boat. But I think we all know that we've been in the same storm, but in vastly different boats. Public support for the NHS is at an all time high and the public are behind a generous pay settlement for NHS staff to reflect our efforts and commitments over the past 12 months. We've been penalised for many years with pay rises that haven't even kept pace with inflation. So in real terms, we have taken a pay cut for years, but this year should be different. It's time this government realised it's the NHS and all the key workers that have got us through this pandemic and we should be rewarded for that. Throughout all of this, I've been upset, shocked and angry, but most of all, I have felt empowered by Unison and my local Labour Party who have been there to support me. At this point, I heeded the call from Angela Rayner, one of our own, as Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, for key workers to step forward and stand for, uh, stand for office. And that's why I'm standing in my own ward in Ganor Burnley, and it's an area that I've lived in for the past 25 years. 
I still haven't got over how upset it made me to see Burnley turn blue on the 12th of December 2019, the first time in over 100 years, and I really, really did feel like moving. I couldn't understand how my little working class Lancashire town could possibly think the Tories were going to be a good thing for us. But then it all came down to that B word and that damn slogan. We need to turn Burnley red again and the only way is to stand up and be counted. If you want to see change, you have to go out there and influence it. And I hear too many people complaining about councils and governments yet doing nothing but, but that complain. Well, it isn't going to change anything. I feel it's important as a trade unionist to value our links with the Labour Party. And by working together, we will achieve better outcomes for the NHS, social care, our overstretched police force and better living and working conditions for the people of Lancashire. And that is something that is so long overdue. I'd also at this point like to thank Unison Regional Office and the Labour Party for their unwavering support in our recent victory for our energy security team at East Lancs Hospitals in winning the pay terms and conditions that they rightly deserve and being brought back in house into the NHS. We must ensure we continue to highlight the failings of this government and, for, and the contempt and hostility that they have for public services and ensure that the town I have always lived in gets back to its working class roots and returns to being a Labour stronghold. I want to do my small part in making sure that the local residents in Ghana have a place they can be proud to live in. Please vote Labour on the 6th of May. Thanks Thank Fiona. I think with candidates like that, with likes of you, we will do very well on the 6th, let's hope. Okay, uh, we're running very short of time. I want to get as many questions in as possible. So I'm gonna go straight to question one, which is from James Tattersall. James, are you on the call? I am, Lynn. Uh, yes, thank you. Very much. Um, my question uh, is for uh, Clive Gunshaw. Uh, good evening, Clive. Hi, James. Um, just for uh, colleagues on the call and the uh, branch secretary, of the uh, Unison branch uh, uh, and obviously we work uh, very close uh, with Clark uh, and have had uh, good industrial relations with him uh, ever since he was uh, elected. Uh, so there's two parts to my question. The first one is, um, what's your plans, Clark, for uh, naval policing going forward? Obviously, Lancashire Police has always um, you know, been renowned as a force uh, that uh, has been excellent uh, in terms of uh, naval policing uh, at all uh, previous HMRC inspections. Uh, we've come out uh, with a very good grading around naval policing. So going forward, uh, what's your, uh, your plan uh, for uh, naval policing? And the second part of the question is, obviously we've seen some forces uh, that have disestablished the role of PCSO uh, obviously, PCSOs are many of them are Unison members. Uh, so again, what commitment can you give uh, uh, going forward in terms of uh, Lancashire Police retaining their PCSOs? Thank you. Thanks, James. I'll um, obviously kind of push for time, so I'll um, I will answer the um, the question quite quickly. In, in some ways, the Naval Police and the PCSOs go absolutely together. Um, you know, absolutely commitment to rebuilding neighbourhood policing. Part of the challenge um, has, has been, as I've mentioned earlier, about the the, the numbers, uh, about police officer numbers, the extent of the cuts, part of the difficulty when they cut over 25% of, uh, of the budget, which is people, 25% of the workforce, uh, means that you lose that connection with the public. Uh, you go to policing to threat, harm and risk, rather than deploying uh, PCSOs and police officers in the public where they pick up a lot of the, the intelligence and support uh, for the public and their concerns that they raise directly with them. So in terms of the uplift and the police officer numbers that are coming back in, we are focused on, on how we can rebuild that relationship with the public. Uh, part of that is fighting for a fair deal from government, getting the, the numbers back in that we deserve to have. Uh, we had a reduction of over, over 750, so we want them 750 back. Uh, but whatever we get, it will absolutely be focused on rebuilding neighbourhood and the, the trust and confidence of the, the public. We've introduced task force officers, and we've built on those this year. 
Uh, we've doubled the numbers of those and those are officers uh, that are dedicated to listening to the concerns of the community and being more proactive in dealing with antisocial behaviour, uh, counterlines, drugs, gangs, um, and, and dealing with those kind of concerns. The relationship issue, um, we're introducing Lancashire Talking, where people can sign up to a conversation with the, the police, messages uh, via text or email. Uh, we've had over, over 70,000 that have signed up over the last 12 months. PCSOs are absolutely integral to delivering both neighbourhood and that connection with the public, but also the, the Lancashire talking. And in many ways, the 70,000 that have been signed up have been signed up by the hard work of PCSOs going out into the community and signing people up. And that is ongoing. Uh, and that is going to be a great kind of a game changer in some ways in terms of the relationship between the, the police and the public. There are lots of things going on that actually are going to make a difference um, in that relationship. But in terms of the commitment that I've got, it is about rebuilding neighbourhood, getting the reputation back, rebuilding that connection with the public, giving the public the visibility, the confidence and trust they need in policing, but also the commitment to PCSOs and PCSO numbers. There was a threat when we was being shortchanged uh, with the uplift because we had to deliver the uplift in terms of police officer numbers. And had we not had the funding for that, we would have still had to deliver the numbers, but the cuts would have fallen on the civilian side of the police force. And as you know, James, we've managed to um, avoid that. And so the commitment is to maintain PCSO numbers. Uh, and once we've gone through the uplift, because quite a number of those get recruited into the, the police with the uplift, to backfill those jobs and make sure, like I said, PCSOs to me are absolutely essential in terms of keeping that relationship between the police and the public. So that commitment's there, James. And if you want any conversations between us about how we can develop that even further, just pick up the phone anytime, right? Thank you. Thanks very much, Thanks very much Clyde. Thanks, James. Uh, can I call Peter Thorne? Peter, are you on the call? Have you got a question? I am, yeah. Oh, good. There we Sorry, go. Yeah. It said question five here, but never mind. Uh, great, Matt, as We're you running so short, up. Peter. Uh, we're in the so I'm trying to get as many different people in as yeah. possible. As I was already mentioned, that we have mayors in Greater Manchester and Liverpool and also in West Yorkshire, um, and Company in North Yorkshire progressing towards their own as well. Regardless of the differing views of what a combined authority and local government should look like in Lancashire, is Lancashire being left behind by the Tories, and how can we make sure that staff terms and jobs and jobs and terms and conditions of employment are protected by any changes? <laughs> Well. All right, okay. Thank you for that, uh, Peter. Um, I think Lancashire is being left behind uh, by this Conservative government. Uh, all the speakers have talked about the cuts, and if I just look at Lancashire County Council, we've lost over £600 million in our revenue budget over the last 10 years, and that's a massive hit to us. Uh, we only have to look at uh, the, settler, uh, the uh, infrastructure uh, funding that's going uh, forward to local authorities and to combined authorities and Lancashire's you been know, been hit really hard you know all the promises from the Tory MPs in the run-up to the general election around uh, um, the Colin Skipton line the Polton to Fleetwood Link first got curves HS2 ready uh, all the other infrastructure projects we talked about not one of them's come to fruition and even in the budget even in the Eden project didn't get the money that uh, it had been promised so we need a combined authority and I think it's time that local authority leaders got their act together, we got a combined authority, and rather than people maybe uh, trying to position themselves to be the next elected mayor of Lancashire, we need to focus on actually what matters to people on the ground. Uh, in terms of the pairs and condition, you know, we, we've, we've got the restructuring going on in Cumbria and North Yorkshire, we'll see the outcome of that. But in Lancashire, you know, we've got we've got district councils, unitary councils, county council, and we've also got the situation where you know Capita run quite a large number of services at Blackburn, Liberata run some services in Burnley and in Pendle. So my view is very much that you know in any reorganisation we need to make sure that two P uh, you know uh, rules and um, uh, procedures are followed very carefully. But 
that's an opportunity for us to bring services back in house. Uh, that's an opportunity for us to, you know, revisit many of the services that are being delivered by the private sector. Look at the terms, the condition of the workers, and bring them back house. And I believe that will deliver better services, Peter. Thanks, Azar. Okay, uh, a question from Elaine. I know your members have asked, uh, uh, wanted to ask a question, Elaine. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, most my question is about social care. Most of our social care members are low paid and work for private companies that make millions. It is clear since long before the pandemic that real change is needed for our social care workforce. So what will Lancashire, uh, sorry, what would Lang uh, Labour in Lancashire do for social care particularly and in light of the pandemic? Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'll call you and then yeah. I'll call Kat on this one as well. Okay, okay. I think briefly, I mean, one of the things, you know, we've committed to doing, as I said earlier, is to review, for example, the sleeping rates, but also to look at other ways in which how we can develop our jobs which are well paid and support our, our population. Uh, and I think one of the things we want to do is work, talk to uh, the court movement and talk to set up not-for-profit organisations which provide the services that the private se uh, the sector provide and if we, where we can uh, dictate and make sure that the terms and conditions of the staff are good, uh, they get a pension and they don't just have, you know, 10-minute breaks, 15-minute breaks, but we're able to deliver services which are, you know, uh, exemplar services. So that's one of the things we want to do very early stages but there are a number of local authorities who are going down that route setting up their own companies to deliver those services and that's what we'll want to do working very closely with uh, Unison. Um, just to sort of like flash that out into more of a national context um, you know the, the last 12 months really have I think shone a light to the public about the realities of the social care sector. I don't think for a moment that any of us on this uh, rally call tonight uh, didn't know it uh, but I do think a lot of the people that I represent as an MP, I think a lot of people across Lancashire didn't see the realities of working in the social care sector. And, and it really should be the impetus the government needed to actually address some of the low pay issues, uh, the fact that people are working across different care homes and the, the way in that spread infection. And um, this should have been an opportunity for the government to really step up. And there was an opportunity at the budget um, for a real financial commitment to go in a long way to solving a lot of problems in social care. But there was nothing in the budget and the Chancellor put absolutely nothing into social care. And instead, what we've got is, is a prime minister saying that he wants to work cross party, but there's been absolutely no reach out. Uh, in Westminster to work with the Labour Party to find a solution to the crisis in social care. Um, so I just want to say upon record my uh, thanks to all social care workers across Lancashire who are working incredibly hard and in the context of 127,000 uh, people who've lost their lives to COVID and of course you know almost half a million people at some point have been hospitalised uh, with COVID. It is our social care workers, it is our NHS workers and our hospital workers who have been there um, holding the hands of COVID patients um, and I've uh, supporting them as they've taken their last breath or celebrating their uh, successful recovery at a point when families couldn't visit. If that does not bring it home to you how incredibly important social care and NHS workers are, then quite frankly, you don't have a heart. And it is about right time that all of these workers are rightly rewarded for the key worker and heroic service that they do. That's Kat. Hold it there though, Kat, because I know we're up, up on time, but I'm going to take one final question from Fiona Wilde because it is a health question. And I think it's only fair after a pandemic we leave the last question to the NHS. So Fiona. Thanks for that, Lynn. Um, I think you've touched on this as well, Kat, but um, the Tories have imposed a pay freeze on most of the public sector and a miserable 1% pay rise on the NHS. Do you agree that clapping won't pay key workers' bills? I suspect that I'm expecting a very short answer to this, and all I can say for you is that I absolutely agree, uh, and that anything less than 1.7% is below inflation, therefore it's actually a pay cut. So when we hear Tories talk about 1% pay rise, can we pull them off on it and call it out for what it is, which is a pay cut, which is no way to treat NHS workers. Thanks very much, Kat. 
Okay, sorry we ran over there, guys. And uh, the only good saving grace of this is you don't have to listen to my closing remarks. I'm just going to say, remember to vote on May the 6th. Good luck to all the candidates. Everyone else, get out there and do as much support as you possibly can. And good luck, everyone.